In the quiet town of Wahlberg, a tale of love, loss, and a fatal confrontation unfolded, leaving a family shattered. A Sunday that turned from peaceful slumber to a nightmare, where tragedy lurked beneath the surface of seemingly peaceful lives. This is the heartbreaking case of Jason Corbett, a story that goes beyond the surface, delving into the complexities of relationships and the human psyche. As we peel back the layers of this heart-wrenching tale, we'll uncover the details of a fatal confrontation, leaving us with lingering questions about love, loss, and the lengths a family will go to protect one another. This is the haunting story of the Corbett family, where reality proved more twisted than fiction. Jason's household nestled in Wahlberg included his wife, Molly Martins, their two kids, 10-year-old Jack and 8-year-old Sarah, and Molly's parents, Tom and Sharon Martins, hailing from Limerick, Ireland. This seemingly peaceful family had a history rooted in tragedy. After Jason's first wife, Margaret, succumbed to an asthma attack, Molly, at the tender age of 24, stepped in as to assist Jason in raising his young children, Jack and Sarah. Fast forward to 2011, and love blossomed between Jason and Molly. The family, now including Jack and Sarah, relocated to Davidson County, North Carolina, where Jason took on the role of plant manager for an international packaging company. In the same year, Jason and Molly tied the knot, and on the surface, life seemed fulfilling for the Corbettes. However, the tranquility shattered in the early hours of August 2, 2015, when a 911 call was made at 3 a.m. by none other than Tom Martins, Molly's father. Frantic and distressed, Tom informed the operator of a violent altercation at their residence, stating that his son-in-law, Jason, was in bad shape, bleeding profusely, and he feared he might have killed him. Emergency responders rushed to the scene, but tragically, there was no saving Jason. The cause of death? Multiple blows to his head. Tom and Molly were then escorted separately to the police station for questioning. In the interrogation room, Molly recounted the harrowing events of that night. It began innocently enough, with eight-year-old Sarah seeking comfort from her nightmares. Molly went to her room, leaving Jason upset about being disturbed. What followed was a heated argument, escalating to Jason attacking Molly and attempting to strangle her. Enter Tom Martins, the 65-year-old father and grandfather, armed with a baseball bat. He corroborated Molly's account, emphasizing that he intervened upon hearing Jason's threats to kill his daughter. Tom bravely confronted Jason, urging him to release Molly, but the aggressor remained unyielding. As the struggle unfolded, Tom struck Jason multiple times with the bat, desperately trying to protect his daughter. The violence escalated with Molly fearing for Tom's life. In a desperate move, she grabbed a decorative garden stone and struck Jason over the head. The clash ended when Tom realized Jason was no longer a threat. He was dead. In subsequent interviews, Tom admitted to his dislike for Jason, even previously advising Molly to seek legal counsel and file for divorce. Strangely, despite the violent encounter, both Molly and Tom displayed no signs of physical struggle, no bruises, no abrasions. So, what truly transpired in the Corbett household that night? For that, let's rewind a bit and delve deeper into Molly's background. Raised in Knoxville, Tennessee, Molly was the only daughter in a family of four children. Her father, Tom, dedicated three decades to the FBI, while her mother excelled in mathematics. Despite her affluent upbringing, Molly's life took an unexpected turn. After dropping out of Clemson University in 2007, Molly found herself in a relationship with Keith Majan. While initially joyous, their lives took a darker turn as Molly battled depression and bipolar disorder. Medication helped manage her mental health, but a bout of staphylococcal infection complicated matters, disrupting the equilibrium of her well-being. Molly's struggle extended to migraines and insomnia, painting a complex picture of her mental health. The vibrant, carefree girl who once coached children to swim now faced a tumultuous journey 
leading to the tragic events that unfolded in the Corbett household. Life took a dark turn for Molly as she grappled with mental health issues, swallowing 16 pills a day while lying on the floor, tears streaming down her face. Unable to continue babysitting, Keith, her partner at the time, took on the burden of providing for both of them, despite his modest income. Behind closed doors, Keith faced the uncertainty of Molly's mental state every time he returned home. Their relationship strained under the weight of her depression, a struggle that sometimes left Molly crying on the floor, lost in a sea of medication. Yet, Keith soldiered on, hoping that a deeper commitment might be the key to improving Molly's condition. In an attempt to provide stability, Keith took the plunge and got engaged to Molly, thinking it might bring solace to her troubled mind. However, the engagement failed to alleviate her struggles, and her desire to have children added another layer of complexity. A glimmer of hope emerged when Molly became pregnant, but tragedy struck with an early miscarriage in September 2007. As Molly's mental health deteriorated further, her parents stepped in, financing her stay in the psychiatric unit at Emory Hospital in Atlanta. Four days later, she returned to Keith, and together, they tried to piece their lives back together. However, by the end of February, the strain on their relationship was palpable, culminating in Molly expressing her desire to escape to Europe and work as a live-in nanny. Keith, uncertain about her ability to handle such a responsibility, especially given her struggles with daily tasks, was hesitant. Despite his reservations, Molly embarked on a journey to Ireland, leaving Keith behind, never to see her again. For Molly, the opportunity to work as a nanny came at a crucial juncture. Feeling lost and inadequate after leaving university, she found solace in caring for Jason's children, Jack and Sarah. In a twist of fate, Molly proposed to Jason to marry in America, and after the engagement, they embarked on a new chapter of their lives. However, the transition was far from smooth. Tracy, Jason's sister, noted a stark contrast in Molly's behavior between Ireland and the States. During the wedding preparations, Molly exhibited controlling tendencies, anger, and a demeanor far from the blissful bride one would expect. Jason's family and friends questioned whether he was making the right choice, with some even suggesting he return to Ireland. By 2014, the strain in Jason and Molly's relationship was evident. Jason, contemplating a return to Ireland, wasn't content in the States. Molly's behavior became increasingly erratic, and he confided in friends about the difficulties at home. Despite being close to Jason's children, Molly's relationship with her husband soured. The couple struggled, and Jason contemplated a move back home. However, the tension escalated when Molly found out Jason intended to return to Ireland with their children, but wouldn't grant her legal guardianship. Jason was reluctant to use Molly's citizenship to secure a visa for himself, fearing it might jeopardize his custody rights in case of a divorce. Amidst these challenges, Molly confided in friends about the alleged abuse by Jason. Neighbors, now keeping a closer eye on the Corbett household, found no visible evidence to support Molly's claims. Despite her accusations, Molly appeared unfazed and unharmed, while Jason, known for his friendly and generous nature, didn't fit the profile of an abuser. On August 2nd, Clad in her pajamas after the bedroom altercation, Molly recounted a narrative of abuse to the detectives. She claimed to have been to the hospital multiple times but never divulged the true cause of her injuries. According to her, Jason was verbally and emotionally abusive, occasionally offering sincere apologies that gave the illusion of improvement. However, the cycle persisted, with each episode escalating into a more harrowing ordeal. But despite the hardships, Molly's love for Sarah and Jack anchored her to the tumultuous relationship. In a chilling revelation, she confessed that she refrained from exposing her husband's abuse because the children weren't biologically hers and lacked U.S. citizenship. The fear loomed that Jason could legally wrench them away from her a fear that had lingered for years. Taking the advice of her attorney, 
Molly recorded instances of Jason's volatile behavior. Though many of these recordings were lost or destroyed, those that survived became crucial evidence in the hands of prosecutors. One such recording, labeled Jason Comes Home Late December 2013, depicted a disturbing encounter. Jason, inebriated and irate, confronted Molly, accusing her of wrongs. The recording captured smacking sounds and Molly's desperate pleas before abruptly cutting off, leaving an unsettling atmosphere. Four days after Jason's tragic demise, the state authorities interviewed 10-year-old Jack and 8-year-old Sarah. Their accounts revealed a pattern of aggression and turmoil within their parents' marriage. Allegations of verbal, emotional, and physical abuse surfaced. Most significantly, the children were aware of these issues. Sarah, responding to questions, revealed that Molly avoided waking up Jason due to his explosive anger. In a pivotal moment, the social worker asked the children if anyone influenced their responses. Sarah's response was unequivocal. Her mom instructed her to tell the truth. Years prior, Jason had designated Tracy as the legal guardian in case of his death, anticipating a potential custody battle. Tracy swiftly flew to North Carolina seeking custody, and Molly, 16 days post Jason's death, filed a similar petition. In January 2016, Tracy became the legal guardian of Jack and Sarah, and they returned to Ireland. However, legal troubles loomed for Tom and Molly as they were charged with second-degree murder. Tracy contended that Molly orchestrated Jason's murder upon learning of his plan to return to Ireland with the children, but without her. The trial in July 2017 painted a starkly different narrative from Molly's self-defense claim. Prosecutors leaned heavily on forensic evidence, showcasing photographs of Jason's battered body. The pathologist's report detailed at least 12 head injuries, inflicted repeatedly in the same spot, leaving severe bruising and cracks in the skull. The injuries were likened to those sustained from a significant fall or a car accident. A blood spatter expert testified that, at one point, Jason's head was 30 to 45 centimeters off the floor, indicating a sustained assault. Toxicology tests confirmed sedatives in Jason's system, prescribed in Molly's name two days before the incident. The revelation that Molly was the sole beneficiary of Jason's $600,000 insurance policy added a sinister layer to the prosecution's argument. Jurors were presented with photos of Tom and Molly at the police station on the night of August 2nd, unscathed and without a hint of physical struggle. The delay in the 911 call raised suspicions, suggesting the couple might have been concocting their story while Jason's lifeless body lay cooling on the floor. As paramedics noted the chilling temperature of Jason's body, the trial scarcely delved into the issue of domestic violence. Tom, in his testimony, portrayed Jason as having significant control over Molly, noting unexplained bruises on her body. Despite these claims, he admitted to never witnessing physical aggression from Jason, except for that fateful August night. The trial unfolded, revealing a complex web of allegations, forensic evidence, and the haunting specter of domestic strife that led to Jason Corbett's tragic end. Before Molly and Tom faced sentencing, Molly candidly admitted that incidents akin to the harrowing events of August 2nd were shockingly commonplace in their household. The only distinction this time was the presence of her father in the house, who became a witness to the tragedy. In a compelling twist, the defense attorney presented a photo from the police station where Molly bore a red mark on her neck, a confirmation of strangulation. The attorney pointed to this as evidence that the alleged abuse was a recurring pattern. Two weeks before the fatal incident, Jason had undergone a standard physical exam, revealing signs of immense stress and uncontrollable bursts of irrational anger. During the trial, the doctor testified to finding defensive marks on Jason's left arm, indicating he may have been trying to shield himself. Intriguingly, no such marks were found on his right arm, the same arm Molly claimed he used to hold her by the neck during the altercation. Nine days of riveting testimony, 
Compelling arguments and haunting crime scene photos culminated in the jury's deliberation. Astonishingly, after less than five hours, they returned with a unanimous guilty verdict for both Tom and Molly. The court handed down sentences of 20 to 25 years in prison, cementing the fate of the accused. However, the legal drama didn't end there. In the aftermath of the verdicts, the defense filed objections, citing judicial errors and jury misconduct. Shockingly, one juror admitted to private discussions about the case before the verdict, a clear violation of protocol. Despite these objections, the court upheld the convictions. In a surprising turn of events, the appeals court in January 2019 granted a new trial for Molly and Tom. The decision rested on the exclusion of evidence suggesting Jason's potential violence towards Molly during the first trial. This exclusion raised questions about the validity of the self-defense claims made by Molly and Tom. Fast forward to February 4, 2020, the North Carolina Court of Appeals not only reversed the convictions but ordered a new trial. A year later, the North Carolina Supreme Court upheld the decision emphasizing the flawed presentation of evidence in the initial trial. Molly and Tom had spent 44 months behind bars before being released on $200,000 bail, each in April 2021. Amidst the legal turmoil, both Jack and Sarah, the young children at the center of the initial interviews, recanted their statements. They claimed they were coerced into lying about domestic abuse, asserting that it was Molly who had been abusive. This revelation cast a shadow over the credibility of the earlier testimony. In November 2023, a new trial unfolded, leading to an emotional final day of sentencing hearings. Molly Martin and her father, Thomas, were ordered to prison for a minimum of seven months. The judge delivered sentences ranging from seven to 30 months for the voluntary manslaughter of Jason Corbett. This additional legal chapter followed the three and a half years Molly and Thomas had already served after their initial murder convictions. As we conclude this gripping journey through the tragic case of Jason Corbett, we're left pondering the depths of human relationships and the unforeseen twists life can take. If this story resonated with you or sparked questions, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to subscribe for more true crime content and ring that bell icon to stay updated on our latest investigations. Until next time, thank you for being a part of our community.